Welcome back. This is episode 17 of Books Closed. This episode is sponsored by Feldman Manufacturing, high quality handmade tattoo machines by Brandon Feldman, and Split Arrow Prints. Print like you give a shit. The last couple of episodes, I've been talking about tattoo businesses and how they came to be and what happened once they were. And this week, I wanted to talk to tattooer Russ Abbott. Over the years, Russ has done seminars and made instructional tattoo DVDs and now is focused on his company, Tattoo Smart, that is pushing out digital tools for drawing and design purposes for tattooers specifically. And like with anyone who puts themselves out there and is pushing these new ideas, I was curious to hear what sort of response he's gotten and his overall opinions on the changing landscape that is tattooing, all while still tattooing full time. I was able to catch up with him at the Bay Area Tattoo Convention recently, and our conversation goes a little bit like this. So we're here in San Francisco at the Bay Area Tattoo Convention. How's your weekend been? Man, it's been incredible. I just tattooed the same guy's torso for two days straight, and uh, it was his first tattoo. He uh, outlined all the way from his neck down to his groin, and uh, came back again. So Damn. Yeah, I was, I, you know, I, I thought he would do it, but about halfway through the first day, I thought, nah, he's not going to do it. <laughs> you know, he was just like, <laughs> he was a little bit cold, and he was... You know, I was trying to pull clean outlines and it just wasn't happening. So I had to kind of switch to plan B and, uh, ended up, ended up working out in the end. He, uh, finally started to, uh, get in the zone, you know, but yeah, we made it through two days and I'm happy with the result. He's going to come back and, you know, power through it. Can you imagine if your only tattoo experience was getting tattooed two days in a row, a piece like that at a convention, like yeah. that's all you know of getting tattooed. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> ignorance is bliss, right? Like he, <laughs> He didn't know what a tattoo would feel like, so, you know, he just accepted what it was. And, uh, you know, sometimes people are uh, able to take a lot more, you know, than, than we expect they will. You know, if we just give them the opportunity to, uh, to be tough, you know. Right. Yeah, sometimes they don't rise to the occasion, but when they do, it's pretty cool. Exactly. So, my first exposure to your work that I can remember was... I think it was a DVD that you did. It had a train. It was a train tattoo. Right. You know the one. I'm familiar with it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I, I was trying to look it up online. I couldn't find what it was. It was called Ironclad. It was um, a DVD. I think it came out in like 2007. But yeah, it was uh, actually I don't think anyone really knows what it was called because it had like three titles. <laughs> um, Ironclad was like the name of the production company that I invented. That was going to be like the company that all of these future products might come out under. Um, and so we made it nice and big and fancy at the top of the DVD. And then it said Illust illustrative tattooing workshop underneath that. And that was the title. That's what I remember. Right. But everyone just called it ironclad. And so that's what it's called, I guess. I just, I, rem <laughs> I remember seeing that and I thought that's how I'm going to tattoo. Oh yeah. And then I realized what happened. <laughs> Good question. I'm still trying to figure it out. Right. <laughs> So that DVD, what was it? You were breaking down different ideas that you had about tattooing and how you approached the art preparation or the actual tattooing? Yeah, it was um, start to finish the process of a tattoo. And it was um, kind of a, a new thing at the time. There weren't a lot of tattoo DVDs out there. It was certainly something that I wasn't, um, you know, I, I considered it very carefully before doing it because, I mean, there's obviously ethical concerns. Um, right. So what I figured out was that I was willing to distribute it myself and personally look into each and every person that was purchasing it to make sure they were really a tattooer. Because I, I didn't want to contribute to um, anything negative coming from it. But I also wanted to you know, just try to contribute something positive to help educate my peers, not, not to teach people that don't tattoo how to do it. So... What was the feedback that you got back from that? Mostly positive. Um, I'm sure there was negative out there, but it didn't make it to me. Right. I did that and uh, started teaching a lot of seminars. Um, I'm sure uh, well, we've got a lot to talk about. I won't get ahead of that. <laughs> but yeah, the DVD was kind of the start of it, of uh, 
me sort of becoming known in the in the world for education for for tattooing was that your first like extracurricular project to tattooing yeah i would say it was i'd done a flash set you know a few years earlier but this was like kind of the first thing putting yourself out there in a different way yeah and it was i mean i, I didn't know how to do any of that stuff i'm not like you you know i had to hire someone to uh to film it and had to come up with the money to uh make the dvds and it was like this whole disaster where the um, authoring on the DVD was screwed up, but I'd paid like several thousand dollars to have a thousand DVDs made. And when they came, there was a glitch in every single DVD. Oh. And it was just like my heart sank, sank, you know, and I had to uh, just do it again. Brutal. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like you finally work up the courage to do this big project. Right. And then you hit a speed bump. Right. But I guess that's always the case, right? Yeah. Yeah, it can be. That's kind of the, the joy of it. It's why it's so rewarding sometimes to uh, get out of your comfort zone and, and do something hard. Yeah. So where does your inclination to teach come from? I'm not sure. I think um, it was it was started as an inclination to learn, you know, not, you know, being a, I, you know, I, I did an apprenticeship, but my apprenticeship didn't fill in all the blanks for me. And so I ended up discovering Guy Itchison's, um mostly his book, Reinventing the Tattoo. Um, that was like the Bible to me. Mind-blowing. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, you can wipe dark colors into light ones and it's not going to ruin the tattoo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's so many ideas that still I, I catch myself if I'm teaching at a conference or something like that. I start to go into like explaining something that I learned from Guy and then I'm like, oh no, I can't, I can't even say it now. Like <laughs> I just have to mention Guy every time because he, he really did write the book. Mm -hmm. As far as it goes for, you know, constructing tattoos, um, at least from his perspective. But a lot of people stay away from guys' stuff because they think, I don't do biomech. I'm not interested in what this guy has to say. And um, I think that's a mistake. You know, it's really, there's so many great fundamentals that um, apply to probably every style of tattooing, but definitely large-scale tattooing. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any aspects of what you do that you don't share with people or that you, that you aren't inclined to, to teach? Well, it just, just depends on the venue. You know, I don't get on Instagram and, and show everybody right. how, how the magic sauce is made. Um, I think that that kind of has the effect of sort of ruining the magic for people. So especially with all the digital design, um, tricks that I have in my tool bag toolbox right now, it's, um, there's, there's what I was doing two or three years ago that, I'm starting to tell people about and there's what I'm doing right now that I haven't figured out enough to teach anyone that I'm keeping, you know, close to the chest. Is it a natural progression where you're always kind of pushing ahead or, or do you really have to buckle down and say, I want to, you know, I've got this idea. I really want to develop it. Or is it just your personality that, that drives you? I think a lot of times it's driven by the technology. Like I'll discover some piece of software and I'll start to dig into it and I'll watch YouTube videos for hours trying to figure out, what that software might offer me as a tattooer. And then if I, if I get excited about some aspect of it, then, you know, I just try to find a way to do a tattoo based on it. And if I can accomplish that, then it's a matter of like, well, was it well received? Are there more tattoos that, you know, people are asking for that are based on this concept or was it just dead in the water? You know, and sometimes it feels like it's just dead in the water and I move on. But, um, just for instance, as an example right now, I'm really excited about getting into 3D sculpting with like ZBrush and 3D modeling software like Maya. Um, these software programs are pretty intense to figure out. And, um, you know, you can watch a ton of videos. You can spend hours online watching videos, but no one's really showing you how to design a tattoo using that software. Like you'll design a tattoo to... To a 3D model is what you're saying. There's a lot of aspects to it. I mean, interesting. I, I, you know, the future that I see for tattooing is that we have 3D scanners on our smartphones. Our clients are standing in front of us, and we walk around them in 360 degrees and, and grab a capture of their body, and then we bring that into software and we draw directly on the 3D model, or we sculpt on the model. Um, we grab images off Google and wrap them around the model and move them around and change their size and rotate transform, warp, distort, you know, you just figure it's, it's like, there's a lot of different aspects to it, but I believe that at the end of that process that I'll have a design that already fits 
the body and then software will allow me to print the design out as a stencil. And then the stencil that was created on a 3D form will wrap and fit every aspect of the body versus you know the all the ways that we try to correct that now. I mean, I do primarily large scale tattoos, so I'm always dealing with how do we get around that joint? How do we you know, get from the, the shoulder cap into the chest muscle and what happens when they raise and, and lower their arm and all those aspects, I think. Um, and, you know, the technology, if it's out there, I haven't been able to find it yet. Maybe I'll create it. Um, I think more than likely the fashion industry will come out with really great tools because, you know, it's in their interest to find a way to give people access to clothes that are perfectly fit to their body. So it's just a matter of time before tattooers can adapt to those. Right. Yeah. Cause it's, it's so great to be able to draw on an iPad, for example, but it's, it's just, you're drawing floating flat above somebody. If you like have a layer of their, of their arm or whatever that you're right. tattooing on. Exactly. What we do a lot of times is we take a photo of our client and then we draw the tattoo, but it never ends up being one-to-one -one. when we make a stencil of that drawing and we go to fit it, there was, you know, the body was turning away from the camera lens and there's a distortion in, in how big, especially off to the sides of the body part, like the chest piece I did yesterday. I always kind of draw wider than the picture because I know mm -hmm. that it's going to wrap. Right. And I sort of have a sense for how much it's going to, you know, shrink on the edges just from experience. But I think it's it's still a better tool than just meeting your client face to face and drawing something on a piece of paper and hoping it fits, you know, right. there's, there's a lot of different, you know, fun little tricks and techniques to, uh, you know, use the digital design and, and it's just a matter of, uh, finding what works for you. I think a lot of tattooers are just now getting their iPad, you know, and, um, you know, that's not really the, the tool that I've been using. I've been using a, 27 inch Wacom Cintiq, you know, that's it's, where it's at, you know, much, much larger screen, um, with a computer plugged into it. So it's hard even for me to, to deal with the tiny screen of an iPad. I feel like the next iPad pro will be larger because that's really all they can do to, I mean, there's a lot they can do to improve the processor it, will improve, right? It's yeah. going to be, um, they've, they just announced Adobe's coming out with their version of Photoshop for the iPad pro. Mm. Um, it's coming out sometime in, maybe mid 2019. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that means, you know, all the other Adobe products like illustrator and all, you know, there's a ton of them. Um, so that means that the iPads processor is getting as powerful as it needs to be to, to do that stuff. Have you always been interested in technology? Oh yeah, definitely. Are um, you a tinkerer? Yeah. I'm more of a tinkerer, always trying to figure out what's next, you know, trying to, trying to be a little bit ahead of my peers and, and find, kind of the, the gold out there in the hills, you know? Yeah. So let's back up a little bit. Let's sure. talk about your, um, just the trajectory of your career when it started to give a little context. So sure. when did you start tattooing? 2008. I, uh, started tattooing out of my dorm room at Georgia state, ordered a kit through the mail. I found out, you know, you could just order a tattoo kit I got my Spalding and Rogers kit with the uh, tattoo artist t-shirt and the certificate. You write your own name in it. You know, it says tattoo artist. Um, got all the little flash in the catalogs and I would like go to the copy machine and like blow the little designs up over and over again. And um, just, it's pretty humble. You know, I got a uh, apprenticeship a few months later. I apprenticed for a guy named Troll. Um, everyone had a nickname back then, it seems like. Um, at a, a shop in Norcross, Georgia. I was 19 when I started, 39 now. So you said you didn't start in 2008. No, you 1998. Said, okay. Did I say 2008? You said 2008. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, damn, you're good. <laughs> 98, Okay, yeah. yeah, clarification, 1998. That makes a lot more sense. I mean, at this point, it seems like a lot of your focus, I mean, at least what you put out, a lot of focus is on digital design. Um, so let's talk about Tattoo Smart then, okay. which is something that I'm sure... A lot of people are either familiar with or they've at least heard of. So what, what is Tattoo Smart? What is your goal? Well, Tattoo Smart is a marketplace. It's just an online store where tattooers like me are selling things that they've created that apply in some way to tattoo design. Um, that's like the general 50,000 foot overview. Um, 
it started with, I just wanted to create a place other than my shop's website to sell things that I was already making. So I had the color wheel that I made um, for Eternal Ink, and I was selling that. Um, I was selling it on Ink and Dagger Tattoo's website. So I feel like that was probably a little weird for Ink and Dagger Tattoo's customers to have to go to our website to and see all these like tattoo education products. So, yeah. so really it just started with that. I need to make another place. So my software of choice is called Clip Studio. And at the time it was called Manga Studio, but they changed the name. Um, it's a, at the time it was only on the computer. iPad Pro hadn't come out yet. So we launched Tattoo Smart. I was pushing products that worked with Clip Studio and trying to tell tattooers about this really great software for tattoo design. And th then the iPad Pro came out. And there was no way that I was going to win the argument to purchase a $2,500 Wacom Cintiq and a $2,500 MacBook Pro just to try digital design. So what ended up happening was I started to notice, like, I mean, people were sending me text messages that knew about the Wacom and knew about my process. And they were like, iPad just killed your shit, dude. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, all right, fuck. So, so you have to adapt at that point. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, Tattoo Smart had to adapt. I could still do what I wanted sure. to do, but we were going to have to, I was going to have to understand what the iPad Pro offered. And um, I immediately started hearing that everyone was into Procreate. So Procreate's an app. It's $12, $13 on the App Store, and it's simple. It's like, you know, when it first came out, it's, it's got a lot of upgrades since then, but it was very basic. Um, but one of the nice things about Procreate was that it was so simple, so people that were new to digital design could figure it out. You could just open it up and start drawing. And if there were any options, they were hidden away, and you had to learn hand gestures to even find them. So it wasn't as stressful. You know, when you open Clip Studio, there's all these buttons everywhere. And so you're like, oh, man, what I can't even keep up with all the buttons. I can't remember what button to press. So I think Procreate won on simplicity. And also, once you do a drawing in Procreate, you can spend 10 hours on it. You can play a little video of your drawing. And um, people were uploading those to Instagram. And that was like a genius move. You know, Procreate really made people want to share the artwork they were creating. We decided to start making some brushes. And there was one that was like... I have to back up a little bit. Um, snake brush. Mm -hmm. Did you see that one? That was the first, the first brush that I saw. So when I was trying to learn how to make brushes in Clip Studio, and I realized they have these brushes that are, I call them repeater brushes now. Um, they're basically, you know, any repeating element, like a rope, a chain, a barbed wire, any of those can be a brush. So you just draw one little chunk of it, and then the brush repeats and it follows your stroke. I had the idea, I don't, I'd never seen anyone do it before. I'm not sure if I was the first, but it doesn't matter. Um, I had the idea to draw that little chunk of snake scale and um, just try to put it into one of those brushes. And so I made that thing and then I just put a little bit of video of it on my Instagram and it seemed to go kind of viral. You know, tattooers were like, like mostly they were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And then there was like, a few people that are like, mm -mm, nope, not for me, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I don't want any part of that. And uh, so I was like, okay, all right. Well, I never intended for people to not draw. That was never the goal. Um, my, my whole idea was, hey, there's this thing that technology can do. Like, let's do it. You know, let's see what there is on the other side of that. Fast forward a little bit. We're like, let's, you know, at first I, I actually put out a free tutorial still available on our site of how to make the brush because that was the goal. You know, I wanted to show other people how to just make the thing that I created. So I made a little like slideshow PDF and put it up on the internet and gave it away. And that's what I like about your stuff is you're not just trying to like sell your own shit. You're trying to facilitate people to really do something for themselves and make more of, you know, build on your idea as mm -hmm. a starting point. And, and to yeah. me, that feels pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's where it all started. I mean, it's, it's still that way, but we just found out that people actually do want to just pay a little money and have the thing, <laughs> of course. you know? <laughs> so Tattoo Smart is, is in the brush set business now, you know? And um, we ended up making probably our most popular 
product to date is the tattoo needles. So, I mean, just going on the same line as the snake, you can um, take a single version of the mark that a Magnum makes. You know, if it's a seven mag, it's the same, you know, needle separation that you have if you look at a seven mag straight on and you load that into a brush and you set the settings to fade away as it gets further away from where you started. And you know, on Clip Studio, you can even make the, the marks get further and further apart. So it looks more like a whip shade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought, okay, combine that with digital palettes. And now you're, you're using the colors you're going to use in the tattoo. You're using the needles you're going to use in the tattoo. There's a, a sort of, you know, tattooers that are new to digital will have the ability to understand that, you know, it's, it's similar to tattooing. So they kind of already know what their process is and now they're just replicating it digitally. Um, yeah. So it went from there and now it's expanding to all of the different things that we've come up with, you know, and um, there's giant sets. I did a set of a hundred different tattoo elements. So there's Celtic knotwork that repeats like a band. Um, there's all these different types of snakes. There's ropes and chains and beads and jewelry. Now, you know, other tattooers are, are starting to contribute more and more and more. You know, we have uh, the newest set, Dave Tevenall. Um, put out his battle damage set and it's just natural media brushes like spray paint and, um, you know, markers and all the tools that he uses to create his, his illustrations. Um, so it's just, uh, expanding. Well, we're going to take a quick break and then if you're listening and you have no idea what we're talking about, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend you go on YouTube and watch some tutorials or just check out videos of people working with this stuff. And I think it'd make a lot more sense and you might find that you're more interested in it than you think. But when we come back, we'll talk about the implications of all this technology on tattooing. Great. This week we're sponsored by Brandon Feldman Tattoo Machines. Handmade coil and rotary machines made with love and intention. That's not his tagline, but I think it's true. Brandon hand makes every part of his machines himself, and if you're concerned with keeping the magic in tattooing, there's definitely some magic in these machines. After talking a bit to him in a conversation that I probably should have recorded because it was pretty funny, I learned that Brandon Feldman, in addition to tattooing and building machines, is an actual engineer. He's got a lot of knowledge, experience, and opinions on what makes a great tattoo machine. I've been using one of his machines lately to line a bunch of tattoos, and I can't say enough good things about it. It runs smoothly and efficiently, and I don't have to crank the voltage to find that sweet spot where the lines just dance into the skin. If you're looking for that one little piece of equipment you're missing that will make you actually a good tattooer, these machines might be the ones. Give them a try. Check out Brandon Feldman Machines at FeldmanMFG.com. That's F-E-L-D-M-A-N-M-F-G.com. And on Instagram at Brandon Feldman. And that's at B-R-A-N-D-Y-N Feldman. Brandon with a Y. We're also sponsored by Split Arrow Prints. Print like you give a shit. Located in Atlanta, Georgia, Split Arrow Prints works with artists to make the best possible prints, stickers, and promotional materials. They're tattooer and artist-owned, offering luxury printing service, including gicle printing with watercolor paper, die-cut stickers, convention banners, business cards, and more. They understand tattooers and the level of quality that you expect. Do you have an idea for a custom printing project? Well, Split Arrow Prints is not scared of your weird ass idea. Get in touch with them today for a quote on your next printing order at splitarrowprints.com and follow them on Instagram at Split Arrow Prints. The best way to support Books Closed is by supporting our sponsors. You can find their links in the show notes or on booksclosedpodcast.com. So with all of this technology and all these new ideas that you've been developing, what would you say to someone who would suggest that this is, these tools would hinder some, a new tattooer's development, that they're cheating, as I've heard people describe right. a lot of this as? Let's start yeah. there, actually, okay. with, with the idea that, that these tools are cheating. Is it cheating? Um, I, the way that I look at it is, it's going to save some time and cut some corners on monotonous tasks. Yes. It's going to cheat on doing something that's actually not that hard to do. Um, my idea would be that a, a tattooer like myself would take that time and put it towards 
maybe doing a color study or spending a little bit more time on the sketch. Um, I do recognize that we are craftspeople with a job to do, with an appointment coming up in an hour and a half that is going to be a little angry if we're not ready. And so when there are tools that will help us achieve our job in a more efficient way, those tools exist. Use them or don't use them, I don't care. I'm gonna use them. I think that we should all be welcome to use them. Um, do I want to print out my digital painting and hang it on my wall and call it art? Absolutely not. You know, When it's time for me to make a painting, I would probably do a digital mock-up and I would probably obsessively think about, that's just me, you know, I like to plan, but, um, me too. I would, I would prepare and I would know exactly what the plan was. And then I would make the painting and then I would be proud. Um, so I think that the, the argument that the way I understand it about the cheating thing is this is going to make it too easy for those people to be like me. And it's just not a healthy way to think, you know? I mean, the fact is, like, we were tattooing before this technology existed, so certain things were harder for us. And when we achieved those skills, we felt more proud of ourselves. And then along comes this, like, cheat to the skill that we felt proud of. And it kind of robs us of the ability to be proud of ourselves anymore. And it robs us of the ability to, in a way, feel superior to other people that don't have that skill. And, um, I think what we actually receive is the ability to understand that skill and put it in a box and move on to a new skill that technology doesn't offer a cheat for. Right. So that's the way I look at it. Um, but you know, again, it's like no one's forcing any tattooer to adapt. It's, I mean, you can, it, there's going to be a time, I think maybe that time is already fast approaching where, you know, not using an iPad is going to make you special, you know, it's just right. like a sign painter that paints without the use of a computer is special. Um, you know, it's kind of funny to think about, but, um, that's just the way it works. You know, it just yeah. keeps, the world keeps moving. New technology comes up. This happens in every single field. And it's usually celebrated. Craft. Well, at first there's always going to be the, the old timer, you know, who's like, no, no, this isn't. This isn't what I signed up for. I'm not into this. And then it's so funny to watch the arc of, of that person go through it. And sometimes it takes six months. Sometimes it takes five years and you see the same person and they're like, yeah, I'm using it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think I've, I've noticed that a lot because you've asked a lot of your guests on the podcast about whether or not they're using a uh, digital design and, you know, I, that's the response I'm hearing over and over again is like, I know people that use it that I really respect. It's not for me, but I could kind of see the value in it. Maybe, you know, not ruling it out, but probably not. And that's fine. The drawing for the tattoo is not the final product anyway. Exactly. Like right. we're still doing the tattoo. There's right. no cheating. You can't fake doing a tattoo. Exactly. No, it's, it's just the drawing for the tattoo is prep work for the real work you know? Yeah. And if someone feels like they can prepare their best version of their drawing on paper, then that I, obviously that's great. But I, I feel more confident on an iPad because of the extra tools, you know, not to mention the efficiency, which right. to me, that's always been kind of yeah. the name of the game with it. I think if, if I want to convince someone who's not yet even aware of why they would want an iPad for tattoo design, the number one thing I would say is it's going to make it easy to just move little parts of your design around and play with different compositions. You know, if you labor over your line drawing and you see this thing that you're not quite really sure you love on paper, sometimes you leave it there and you just let it be, you know, if you're using digital, you, you erase it or grab it and move it. You stretch it, you warp it, you try different things. And right before your eyes, you can see all the different possibilities without having to retrace the whole thing or do some kind of weird like Frankenstein job with tape scissors. Right. Um, you know, just changing the size of something on a copier and getting it to the exact size that you wanted used to be like 10 sheets of copy paper while you figured it out. And now it's just an instant 
task. So yeah. just for that alone, next I would tell you about symmetry rulers, about the fact that if you want to draw a dagger perfectly symmetrical, you can just draw one half and the, the machine draws the other half. And then if you want to, um, oh man, there's so many. Um, I use perspective rulers sometimes. So I'll set up rulers that allow me to create perfect 2D or sorry, two point and three point perspective. Um, I use this concentric circle ruler. So you like tap a dot in the middle of the screen and every circle you draw is centered on that dot. So maybe Ooh. you want to draw like a vinyl record um, and put it on a, um, a gramophone, right? So I've done a design where I use the concentric circle ruler and drew all the circles for the record in about five seconds. And then I transform that circle into the right perspective to fit on top of the gramophone. So this highly technical drawing that would just drive me completely crazy is now all of a sudden possible and I'll do it because I can. And why wouldn't we want to have the best stencil possible for something like that? Style, I guess. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, it, it works for me. You know, I, I, I think that people, tattooers, artists should do whatever makes them happy and whatever makes them feel fulfilled. Why do you think people fear change so much? Because in that this is a thing bigger than tattooing, obviously, right. but in the context of tattooing, why, why are people so unwilling to do some, try something new? Fear. You know, fear that their livelihood is going to be called into question. Like if, if what was so hard for me to accomplish is all of a sudden easy for all the new kids to accomplish. And we see it, you know, we see ta tattooers with one or two years experience going totally viral on Instagram. And, um, you know, it's, if, if you're starting to go a little gray in your beard, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a legitimate fear, right? You know, like what is the age group of tattoo collectors? For me, I feel like my clients are 10 years younger than me and they're 10 years older than me. So I'm 39 now. That means I'm, my clients are 29 to 49. And, and I don't, I haven't actually studied it. I don't know <laughs> if that's true, but it just feels like that way. I'm not getting yeah. 18 year old clients that are seriously trying to get tattooed by me. So that's just the way it goes. I mean, we, as tattooers, um, there's a large community of aging tattooers right now who are, you know, kind of faced with the, the fear that if they don't adapt, if they don't spend all this time on social media, if they don't figure out how this iPad thing works, that they may be left behind. People of like the era that you started tattooing, there aren't, I'm, I don't know of many that are as outspoken about embracing this new stuff. It's almost like, uh, like shameful in a way. Yeah. Which yeah, is, it is. And, and I understand that they're, they're probably, it's just rooted in being intimidated. Yeah. Like you're saying by the, just trying to learn something new and it's like, well, I can already draw on paper. Why am I going to spend this time to learn how to draw again when I can, when I've done it for so long? Yeah. I mean, a lot of them probably talked a lot of shit about it at one point, you know, and they, you know, if they're considering whether or not they're actually going to get into it and then they have to face that, you know, in some way they just have to be comfortable. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. With those same people, there was a generation before them who was laughing at them for not using acetates anymore or right. using copy machines because it's it's yeah. just it's just a better version of the stuff that we used to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, at one point, tattooers argued about having to wear gloves. Right. <laughs> That's <laughs> that was <true>. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All these kids yeah. wearing gloves, so that they're going to live longer, which means they're going to tattoo better because they've got longer <sighs> careers. Ooh. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you can take it way far back, you know, when it comes to like people complaining about using a tool, um, to do a job, it's like, all right, well, you know, like who was the first caveman that like used a, a sharpened stick to, to draw something, you know, and were the cavemen before him like, no, 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 we're not doing that. You know? <laughs> right. Right. That's such an interesting, like human trait Yeah, that, we're just going to reject something at first before even considering it. And then right. slowly we work down and we're like, well, he just drew those three little walk-ins real quick. Right. Or he just, you know, he pulled them up cause he drew the same one last week and it's still on his thing. Mm -hmm. He just printed out. I don't know. Yeah. I love it, but I'm also at an age where I've embraced technology my whole life. Right. So I grew up on computers. I grew up on the internet since I was right. 10. So 
I, I yeah. understand that I've got a different perspective on it than a lot of people, and especially a lot of older people who I look to for guidance and stuff in tattooing. Right. Well, I think what I see a lot now, a lot of people talk to me about this stuff. Um, I, there are a lot of tattooers who, if they were teaching another tattooer, they would like for them to start on coils, even though they may be a rotary user with cartridges, right? But they want, they think that they should learn the hard way. So they should learn to draw on paper. They should. And I, I'm not opposed to that. Do you think there's value in that? I think, I think there's value in it. I think that for me, I would have my apprentice kind of learn everything. There's just so much to, uh, to get from all the different processes, you know? Um, so it's, I, I, I definitely don't think that I would like to see an apprentice never be forced to draw on paper. Well, I mean, first of all, they, they should be drawing on their own because they love drawing. Right. <laughs> so like, forcing them to draw, that's kind of a problem. But, um, you know, I have, uh, I'm going to have an apprentice soon. And, um, you know, she's, she's been at the shop kind of acting like an apprentice for quite some time now, but I don't call her the apprentice yet. Hopefully she, when she hears this, she's going to get all giddy. Cause I just said she's going to be an apprentice, but congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, one of the, uh, the projects that I came up with for her was to, um, create basically a brush set of all the, uh, we're going to call it the minimalist set, but it's really the Pinterest set. Um, so, you know, these are some of the most popular walk-in tattoos all over the world right now. And so I had, her name's America and I had America research all the most popular tattoos on Pinterest and basically make a, a report for me and, um, and a list, you know, description of them. And then I had her redraw them so that they were at least somewhat original. They were, you know, at some point someone might've got a custom tattoo and everybody else has been copying it and they feel like, Oh, it's okay. Cause it's Pinterest, but I feel like, all right, well, we'll, we'll start fresh and we'll just draw them well and we'll make good tattoo designs and we'll, we're making an 18 by 24 poster of all of them crammed in together. There's like 130 of them and, uh, they're brushes. And when you're in procreate, you just tap on the brush. We named them all after girls. So <laughs> that's fun. Um, <laughs> these brushes named after a different girl. So you can pick up Amanda and, um, it's probably like a bird flying off a feather or whatever. And you just touch the screen. So if you have your client in the studio, you can take a picture with your iPad of the person's arm and go into the other room where she can't see the magic and pull up your, you know, touch Amanda and put the bird on her arm and, um, go show it to her. And she'll probably ask, can she see it a little smaller? And so you can like make it a little smaller and then she's going to want to see it a little smaller. And, and yeah. so you, and you'd say, okay, that's as small as we can go. And then she's going to be like, okay, but can you turn it upside down? Cause I want it for me. <laughs> And, and with the and, click of a button. Yeah, with the click of a button. So, like, I mean, I think most tattooers that are dealing with that situation are going to be happy to have this tool. I don't think that it's Sounds going great. to harm anyone's, like, deep-seated artistic, um, you know, feelings about tattooing to to just go ahead and tattoo her, you know, and yeah. give her what she wanted. So, I mean... Sorry, that was just a wild tangent from what you started with. But. I don't think so. I think <laughs> I think it was is pretty in line with where we're going with this. Um, but it, it's funny to think that a lot of the the goals or the ethics or the the purpose behind what like an old fashioned tattooer might have done was a lot of it in the name of of efficiency. Right. And so for that kind of person to reject an ultra efficient version of what we already do, yeah, I have a hard yeah. time seeing why up, other, other than what you said is that people just fear getting left behind or, or the fact that someone else has this efficient tool with that they didn't have when they started. Right. That's gotta be it. I think it is. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we can all accept or and move on, you know, and keep, keep doing what we're doing. That's, I think that's, what's going to happen. You know, it's just, it's already happening. I mean, I've been following this very closely for several years now, you know, from the time when I, I was part of a very small group of tattooers that were heavily using digital design, you know, I was using the Wacom in the computer to, for everything. Like I haven't touched a sketchbook, 
you know, for me that I'm fine with that. A lot of people still like to have their sketchbook and they want to keep their hands on paper. But for me, I, I just completely switched. And, um, you know, that, that brings up another point of something I was scared of at that time when I did make that switch, I was scared of not having these physical relics of my work. Um, cause I always saved my line drawings. I always saved my sketchbooks five, six years into not having those things. I have to ask myself like, well, do I regret, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure that I don't, you know, I mean, I, if, if I want to take the time and create something that's meant to, to save for all time and to hand down to my kids, I'll do that, you know, but I'm not going to keep feeling like all those boxes of shitty line drawings of tribal armbands that I saved from 1999 are like anything that anyone's ever going to want to look at. You know, I'm not sailor Jerry over here, you know, <laughs> like no one's going to retire on, uh, on selling my drawings. So, um, and I would argue that it's easier to catalog your drawings digitally anyway. Yeah, sure. It would be, you know, oh, well, I mean, that's how it is. Every single client of mine has a, a file, you know, I have a folder called digital illustrations. And if, if you were getting tattooed by me, there would be a file called Andrew Stortz and every single thing from every project we worked on, every reference, every thing that I would ever possibly need is always stored there. And of course I have to back that up, you know, mm -hmm. it's backed up on the cloud and it's backed up on an external drive. So I can't lose it. Um, it's highly convenient. I used to have like a folder, like an accordion file you know, alphabetized with everyone's crap and, you know, you'd dig through it and it wouldn't be there. I don't know where they go. Yeah. Yeah. You pull out the thing you need and then it doesn't yeah. quite make its way back to where it's supposed to be. Exactly. And then the whole system's fucked. Yeah. <laughs> and there's other ways to completely fuck yourself when you're a digital tattooer, right? You can, you know, run out of batteries. Yeah. <laughs> you can, uh, forget to bring your stencil printer to a convention that doesn't have any way to get the design out of the computer. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, there's, there's definitely ways I was doing a seminar. Um, it was like a free tattoo smart demo at a paradise gathering a couple of years ago and I'm getting ready to, to start, you know, I've got everything set up. I brought, I've got this huge Wacom. I've got screens, all these screens. It's like this room, you know, like we're just surrounded by microphones and shit. Um, power goes out. I'm like, Oh, this is ironic. You know, I've got fucking 40 tattooers sitting in the room waiting to hear some, me drop some genius shit on them. I'm like, well guys, um, lesson learned. <laughs> well, what did you do? I, I picked up the iPad and I walked out to them, you know, and I was like, this isn't what I wanted to show you, but I'll show you something else. And yeah, uh, we got through it. It was the power came on eventually. I mean, it's just bad timing. Murphy's law, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's talk about, because I'm interested in the way you approach things. Um, it seems like you've got a lot of structure, and it seems rooted in like a very traditional educational system. Are we talking about my tattoo work or? The, well, like as you explain your, uh, your future apprentice, you're, you're like giving her projects and you're giving her assignments. Mm -hmm. And then the way that you cataloged your things in the past, like it, it seems like you have a lot of structure where I find tattooers aren't necessarily the most organized or dependable people in a lot of ways. Right. What's, what's your education background, your experience in school? I have a high school diploma and, um, what kind of student were you? Straight A's man. Come on. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was like super eager to always get, you know, the positive praise and, um, you know, straight A's until like maybe 11th grade or so which is probably a little late to smoke weed for the first time, you know, and like <laughs> realize that it's all a big lie, you know, like yeah. I was, but yeah, for the longest time I was like, you know, always the, the smart kid, you know, the, uh, the nerd, honestly. Um, but you know, I, I, I thought that I should go to college after high school and, um, I didn't have the idea to tattoo yet. So I started going to Georgia state and I thought I might be a graphic designer. So I was taking, but it was core classes too. And they put me in this art history class and I, I was just like, so lost. I ended up just like failing out of that shit. And you know, it was, you know, it was just too immature for uh, a real focus on higher education at that time, you know? So luckily I found tattooing and, um, 
I've heard that story a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, at first it was just like, let me explore this for a while. Like maybe there's something at the end of this road. Let me just try it, try it out. And, you know, it was, it's so funny to think back because I probably at the time when I first started tattooing, I'd probably literally seen like 10 good tattoos or even tattoos at all in person. You know, it was just such a, like an alien thing to me. I didn't like come up surrounded by a bunch of tattooed people. I just felt really drawn to it. And, um, what do you think it was that drew you to it? Man, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I definitely wanted to get tattooed. Um, and I'd gotten a few tattoos out of the house, um, by a guy who had the kit, you know? So I found out that you could get the kit and then, um, the first thing that I did was I, well, I was really into drawing always, you know, like I was, that was kind of one of my things. That was one of the ways I showed off. So I, um, I wanted to order the flash catalog that I'd seen he had because it was just full of all these tiny pictures of tattoos. And, um, that's actually what happened. I ordered the flash catalog and it came with the supply catalog. So I'm, I'm, you know, I really started with this like genuine, just want desire to look at tattoos and, um, and to draw them. You know, I remember like looking at tiny pictures of, you know, like uh, koi fish or just, I'd like to call it a koi, not a koi fish. Let me retract the fish. <laughs> but, um, I was looking at drawings of koi and, um, trying to draw them, you know, trying to draw the cherry blossoms and, um, looking at tiny pictures in my dorm room and, uh, and, uh, and then the catalogs just over there, you know, hanging out on the table all of a sudden I, uh, start looking over there, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I remember as far as being drawn to it. It was just sort of a thing that happened. Um, I can't quite explain it. And to me, that's like the most genuine way that you're just like primally drawn to the imagery. It's yeah. like the purest way I think to find tattooing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it is. I mean, it's just what it was, you know, I grew up in the burbs, man. Like I just, you just wanted to be bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. Yeah. You also seem very business minded or you're interested in business. Yeah. Um, from starting that with that first DVD project that you kind of went out on a limb to do, I'm sure. Yeah. And you own your shop and now you're doing all this other stuff and all these projects. It, it seems like you do everything with purpose. Have you ever heard of the book? Um, Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. I've heard of it. I don't, I'm not super familiar with it. So, the the one of the basic premises of that book is that you can um, find something that you're interested in and create a product. And having that product out there selling, even while you're sleeping, creates this residual income that you can, you know, rely on in a way to sort of prop up your in my case, your tattoo income, which, you know, when you're tattooing, you're, you're limited by the market and your time. So when you're trading your time for money, there's a cap, you know, a tattooer that solely relies on tattooing and, and doesn't have their own shop and doesn't have products that they create is essentially, you know, going to have a cap on their income. Um, that person is probably not going to be doing a great job of, um, say saving for retirement, spending the several thousand dollars. It probably costs a lot of people's families for health insurance as a tattooer. You know, they're just, you know, they're taking care of essentials, but they're not necessarily like thinking ahead. And, um, so, you know, I kind of always felt like, you know, I was probably going to want to have my own tattoo shop. You know, maybe that would create a sort of sense of, um, income I could rely on, but, you know, making products that was like definitely inspired by that book. And I, I think it's something that, you know, I recommend that book pretty often. Um, but you know, you don't have to read it to know that, you know, you could be making prints of your artwork or you could be making a brush set for tattoo smart or whatever it may be, like whatever you're interested in, whatever you think that you can create that other people are going to be interested in potentially purchasing. Um, we all have social networks of people who, you know, if they're, they're your friend or they look up to you, they might buy the thing, you know, just because they want to be nice. And, um, yeah, so it's, it, it started with the DVD. It was successful. Um, then I decided to make a book. I made a book called ornamental archive. Um, 
and uh, looking into it, it's going to be kind of expensive to make a book. Um, and I just heard about this new platform called Kickstarter that was had just come out. And the idea, you know, probably at this point everyone knows what it is, but you can create a campaign, make a video, um, just ask the world to support your your thing. And at the end of it, they get the thing. So that's how Kickstarter is different than GoFundMe. You know, you're actually getting something. You're basically pre-ordering. If I'm able to raise enough money, I will make the thing, and then you will get the thing. And um, so I made a Kickstarter campaign, and I was probably one of the first tattooers to to try to create a product using Kickstarter. And I raised a little over fifty thousand dollars, and I needed twelve thousand. Wow. Um, so I made more books and I ended up deciding to do it again. And I, I came up with the, uh, the color wheel for eternal ink. And I wanted to make this like device with several layers and masks that you could move around on top of the color wheel. So you can see different color schemes. And uh, I wanted it to look like a vinyl record and, um, <laughs> fit inside a record sleeve and all this stuff. So I went back to Kickstarter, ended up raising all the money that I needed and then some. And, you know, I mean, it, it, there comes to a point where, you know, people are like, all right, man, like, you don't have to do the Kickstarter thing anymore. Like, there's there's other ways. But um, it's definitely something that people could benefit from if they haven't already done it. Um, yeah, because when people get the product, then, you know, it's a fair exchange. It's not a handout. Right. So if you keep making the stuff that people want, then I feel like you could potentially do that over yeah. and over again. I mean, I've got ideas. There's a thing that I'm not talking about that I, I probably will do a Kickstarter for. Um, you sure you don't want to mention it right here? No, I don't. No. <laughs> Cause I'm not really 100% committed to following through on it. You know, it's a little like outside of my, my realm, you know, I've got to, I've got to basically carve away enough time and attention to make it happen. And that's the way it is probably for, a lot of us, um, a lot of our peers that are like sort of business minded and you're always, you know, you have a hundred ideas a day, you know, you, you file one of them away for the maybe list and it just goes on and on and on until eventually you have to like actually do something. But, and the biggest thing is actually finishing it. Right. You know, like you have to, you have to actually finish shit. Uh, <laughs> and, and when you do, it's, it's a great feeling, you know, and then you have to, once you've finished it, then you have to continue to talk about it. And that's where it gets really hard because you feel a little weird, you know, like always jumping on your Instagram and talking about a product. And that's why it's nice to have distributors, you know, when you have a company like tattoo smart, that's out there as tattoo smart talking about your product, like it, it kind of takes that pressure off you socially to be always out there, like peddling your stuff. Um, I think that's the real power. That's why so many tattooers like to have their flash sold by someone else or like to have their book sold by someone else because it just takes all the pressure off. You don't have to go to the, the post office and put the thing in the mail. Um, you, you just let someone else worry about that. Right. And it's tough because social media is so saturated with people selling. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much the, what the model is built for. Right. There's clever ways to do it, you know. Um, it seems like the algorithm doesn't want us to, you know, make any sort of salesy post anymore. Like if you do make the post, no one sees it. So, I mean, you can you can pay to uh, to have people see it, but, um, you know, the I think the best tactic is to you know, probably is uh, just to try to like slide the thing that you're making and the story of making it into your regular feed, right? You know, just like little bits and pieces of the process and, um, just little, little hints, little things. And then ultimately, you, you know, you want to create the ability to reach out to people in a way, like even outside of social media. So I, you know, I, I've been busy for many years creating a mailing list, you know, Tattoo Smart has a newsletter, which means we have your email address and now I can try to market to you through there. Even if Instagram crashes and Facebook goes away, I've still got that email address I can use. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. You know, it's like, don't depend on the platform of the social media that you're really badass at to always exist and be what people are paying attention to. Cause that's a good way to kind of lose it all real fast. I have a good friend who's a tattooer who has well over a million followers on Facebook and he makes a post of a tattoo and three people comment on it. Are a billion people seeing that shit? I don't think so. No. no. 
So, I mean, and Facebook's the worst because they, it seems like every, every half year or more, they'll just totally change their focus to try to keep you more engaged. Yeah. And so now page it like a business page isn't shit. Right. It's like no engagement. No one see like you said, mm-hmm. no one sees it. No. Yeah. And it put so many, so much time and effort and resources into building that. Yeah. <laughs> Even people that do all their corresponding through Facebook messages or Instagram messages and like, well, what, like what's going to happen when that's gone and you no longer know how to contact any of your, co- like your best customer, you don't know how to reach them. It's yeah. Sca- it's scary. Yeah. I think email is the safest, but yeah, me too. I mean, then again, you know, we, we send out marketing messages and it goes straight into some like spam folder and no one sees them. So right. I think, uh, you know, our, when we send out a newsletter, it might go out to, you know, thousands of people, but only 20% of them will open it and, you know, 1% of them will click on it. Mm-hmm. Do you think yeah. it gets easier to pursue a project like the ones you've done? Like after the first one, was it easier to do the second one? Yeah. I mean, one of the first things that, you know, it happens is you, you start to learn how to build a good team around you. You know, like I have a, um, a marketing manager at my studio. She works with us at Ink and Dagger and with Tattoo Smart, you know, so we have someone who's, you know, highly educated and professional at crafting those emails and making our Instagram post. And we have graphic designers that we work with, you know, these are things that I could probably learn to do, but I can't do them all. So, you know, as, as it grows, you just kind of like start to put together all the pieces of your, of your team. And, um, and that's what creates the appearance that one person is capable of not sleeping and producing so much. A lot of times. How do you manage your time? I get a lot of sleep. I get, you know, seven, eight hours of sleep and I tattoo four days a week. And I spend the other three days essentially juggling um, other things, you know, like business phone calls or working on designs for clients or hanging out with my family. I have three kids and a wife, so there's a lot to do. Um, I try to travel a lot, you know, try to go on a lot of vacations with my family. Um, I guess I'm working efficiently because I, I don't feel like I'm one of those people that's just like burning the midnight oil all the time, you know. I still get time for just sitting on the couch and watching TV, you know, it's just, just got to find the balance, you know, you got to, got to organize. I I thought it would be important to organize my life around how much I reasonably would like to be tattooing, how much I could be, you know, fulfilled at being tattooing without like breaking my back and, and making room in my life for all the other things that I probably was not doing a great job at making room for before. So, I mean, it feels pretty balanced now, but I know that's the thing that a lot of tattooers struggle with. It's, you know, yeah, that's why I asked number one, like, I I guess the best advice is to, to find a way to afford maybe through, you know, creating products, for instance, to find a way to afford to tattoo as much as you actually want to, you know, trading your time for money or creating some other way of getting income. And that's, that's pretty much the key to the life that I'm living now that, you know, it's, it's okay. If I get a cancellation, I'm, I'm actually pretty happy. You know, I got, first I got a huge deposit because I'm really big on that, but (laughs) you know, if it's a last minute cancellation, they they might, they're they're probably just not going to cancel if they can help it, you know, but, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's like, okay, cool. I've got a long list of other things I can do with this time that will also eventually yield some sort of financial incentive potentially, or maybe it's just fun. Do you get people that know that you're, you're like a doer. So they come to you and they pitch their ideas to you. Is that something that happens? Yes. All the time. Have you ever ended up working with someone to help develop their ideas? Um, well, tattoo smart products, you know, I'm, I'm at the the right. helm of, of all of those product sure. ideas. Um, but I also get the people who are like, you know, just have an idea and want to tell someone about it who might be able to have some advice. Um, happens all the time. I know that it probably happens to, it definitely happens to all the guys who own the supply companies and all the guys that make, you know, sure. guys and girls that do everything in tattooing, you know, kind of attract the next big idea. And, and you know, everyone wants to, to figure out what their, their million dollar idea is going to be. And I don't think that usually is the way it works. Um, it's maybe a lot of little things that build up 
to, to create, you know, like an overall picture. But um, I tend to just, I get really nervous because I know that I probably have maybe also had the same idea. And what I'm most scared of is that someone's going to share their idea with me and then it's going to steal my thunder away from feeling okay about making it or mm -hmm. it's going to create the situation where if I do make it, they're going to say that I stole it from them. So usually if you were to say, hey, Russ, like after the recording, you're like, I got an idea. I want to pitch it. I would say, hey, man, like just, just so you know, like I might have already had the idea. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to tell me just – you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my honest opinion, but, um, yeah, it's kind of, I, I don't know. It's I, can you relate? Can you understand that? Like it's, I, mean, I, I usually it's, um, it's fine. You know, I can just give people yeah. my opinion and, um, tell them, you know, what, what the first step to exploring the idea is. Have you ever helped someone dodge a bullet? Their own bullet? Oh yeah. I mean, I, can, I wish I could think of specifics, but we probably wouldn't want to name it anyway. Yeah, definitely after the after the Kickstarter successes, there were other people that wanted my advice on Kickstarters, and well, I feel like you see that and you're like, oh, that's yeah, easy, right? Yeah, and I, I have advised a few. You know, um, I advised uh, Dave Tevenall on his book. I advised Guy Itchison on the the Biomech Encyclopedia. And these are people um, that got the goods, though. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, th I think the biggest thing is people don't understand how the platform works. They think, okay, I want to like. I want to get this space in my town and um, convert it into like an art space for kids or something. And I'm like, okay, well, what's the thing? What's the product? Because everyone that donates on Kickstarter wants to get the thing. So is it a book about the process of creating the, the space or is it a documentary film? Like there has to be a thing for Kickstarter. If not, go to, you know, uh, Indiegogo or go to GoFundMe or, you know, there's a lot of different crowdfunding platforms that just have a different purpose. So that's a lot of the advice I give. It's just like, you're, you don't belong on Kickstarter. This idea goes over here and here's the challenges you're going to face. And that's probably pretty valuable advice for someone who can't figure it out on their own. Right. Well, that's how they figure it out. You know, they right. seek counsel and they, they try to try to do their homework so they don't fall into a giant gaping hole. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It's funny that you can get overlooked for all the other stuff you do, but your your day to day is truly still tattooing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have uh, four days a week of uh, trying to mainly do giant tattoos. Now, mm -hmm. um, I, I made a conscious decision to just focus on large scale work, and um, so it, it it's funny. Um, you know, your podcast is about social media and technology a lot. So, like, when you're Work is all like too big for a phone screen, which has kind of always been a thing for me. Like I, I do a lot of sleeves. It's, it's, it's really disheartening to like depend on likes and comments and, and then put up this thing that you worked for, you know, 60 hours on and, uh, and have like crickets and yeah. then to, you know, and then there's the tattoo that you do. That's like six inches by six inches. That's really eye catching on a screen. And all of a sudden the world seems to love it, you know? And I think that, uh, you know, I've definitely experienced the, you know, the, the effect that that has on myself, you know, just to kind of like make me think, oh man, like, I guess what, what I'm doing is not worth it. Or, you know, maybe I should just say fuck it and, and start catering and pandering to the, the needs of, of the internet. But, um, you know, that'd be a shame. It'd be a waste exactly. of, of yeah. your, what you want to do. <laughs> right. So, so that, that's where it's at for me now. It's just about like, you know, I feel like I'm backing away from social media a little bit, you know, I'm because it's crazy it. that we feel like that that's even something that you have to consider. Yeah. Like maybe I should change what I want to do because yeah. of this thing. That's like, I'm not even that keen on other right. than for like using it for my business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shit. What is, how long has Instagram been around now? Is it seven years or probably, probably yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, my daughter's, six and a half and i know that somewhere at the beginning of my feed you can see pictures of me holding her as a child as a baby you mm -hmm. know an infant um so yeah it's been a long time you know it's like maybe it's time to stop <laughs> you know but then there's that fear of like oh no what if there's this like opportunity that doesn't come because you know i'm not present anymore or 
you know, what if, what if I can't sell my thing anymore because I'm not there? Right. So I guess we'll keep forging ahead. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's always just troubleshooting. Yeah. Like, and I think that's the reason that people will post videos of their tattoos more now because that can give you a better sense of large work. Right. Because a, yeah. a flat photo of a sleeve is never going to do it. Right. It's, yeah. And a video is closer. Obviously, it's still tiny. Right. Yeah. Well, if you're working on large scale stuff, I mean, like the, the torso piece I did the last two days, um, you know, it's one of probably 15 tattoos that I have ongoing right now. And so I, you know, you don't get the everyday post of the completed work. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to come up with ideas of how to sort of like tease the in progress photos and um, just kind of keep something happening on the feed. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes show the design process, you know, like I put a time lapse video of one of my designs on my IGTV, use that for the first time. Um, you know, kind of a time lapse of my digital design process on there. Um, yeah, just, I mean, it's fun, you know, it's just, it's important to not depend on people's likes and comments and praise, you know, I keep telling myself that, you know, like, I think we're all there, like all, I, I don't, I don't know a tattooer who's been on Instagram for several years that doesn't feel like they used to be more popular, you know, there's, it's a lot not of built like, to keep you at a level. It's built right. to always change and, and someone else is always going to climb up ahead of yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. But you know, so it, it, there's probably a lot of like subtle depression going on out there in the world of tattoo artists, you know, <laughs> just like wondering what happened to their careers. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that, uh, they should feel that way. You know, I agree. I mean, it's, it just kills creativity and I don't yeah. think that anyone who really looks into it could argue that. Right, because if it's going to force you to to deviate from what you what you see and what you want to do, then that's like that's that is just taking the spirit out of artwork. Right, and it sucks because it's like the whole social side of it is what creates these weird misconceptions or these weird feelings that we might have. But our our initial motivation to do it is because visual arts are meant to be shared. That's the whole point. Mm. If you do a bunch of paintings and you hang them up in your basement, no one ever sees them they have value to you, but they could have so much more of an impact to everyone who sees them. And so it's a shame when you do the work and then you're willing to share it and it still gets stifled. Yeah. It's a shame when you do the work that you think will have impact and it doesn't get impact. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get a response and it's uh, <laughs> fuck man. It's just, well, what is the solution? You're an idea guy. Oh, uh, I, I have no clue what could, uh, what could change. Like what, what would the next Instagram do differently to, well, I mean, I think a lot of people would say to take the algorithm away, <laughs> you know, bring it back to, um, you know, what it was before. I mean, the, the algorithm is primarily designed to keep us scrolling so they can serve us ads. Right. Yeah. And, and, and Instagram and Facebook need to sell ads in order to exist. So we all get that, you know, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely totally different than it was before, you know, for artists at least. Um, so I think the, I guess the best thing I can think of right now is just to, to figure out a way to not rely on it. You know, don't forget about your website. You know, yeah. I think that those, those are still a thing. Do you monitor the traffic of your website? No, it's, I mean, it, it's, I, it, it's real low on mine. <laughs> it's probably low on mine too, but we do funnel all of our appointments through it. You know, in order to contact someone at my shop about a tattoo, you have to go to inkanddagger.com and, and we do that to, you know, kind of get everybody through the funnel that we've designed. Um, it's a good idea to keep watching and keep paying attention to what might be next. And if there is, if there's a, uh, what was the name of that platform that popped up a few months back that everyone Vero. jumped to? Okay, right. So I, I was one of those people that was on Vero at the beginning of the day <laughs> because I saw some tattooers say like, hey, you know, we're over here now and uh, maybe it's a thing and maybe it isn't. And I kind of felt like, well, I want to make sure that I grab Russ Abbott and yeah. Ink and Dagger and I'm no sure one else is going to get them. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go and, and I do kind of like the idea that Maybe there's another platform that we could all go to. That sounds fun. Um, and so I made a made the obligatory, like, I'm over on Vero post. And, like, I swear, man, like, at the time when I made the post, it worked. 
you know, mm-hmm. I can't claim credit for breaking it, <laughs> <laughs> but a number of us all went on this at the same time to the same place and tried to make accounts and somehow it was too much and they weren't mm-hmm. ready for it. And, um, so, you know, all these people were going over there and then coming back to Facebook and going, man, it doesn't even fucking work. Like it keeps refreshing and it won't load. And, uh, you know, we just never went back. So, I mean, maybe the next, um, social media platform will be ready for us. <laughs> it shows that there, that it can happen. Right. That's what I saw in all of that mm-hmm. is that there's a large group of people. And I read a couple of articles about it cause I was trying to make fun of it on YouTube Right. and it wasn't just tattooing. I'm sure tattooing was a huge group of people that went over to it in the same day, like you said, but there were other, um, people that do like cosplay. There was like huge other groups of people that also went to it. So there's definitely a need for it outside of tattooing too. Right. So it's just going to take the right person to figure out what that's going to look like. Oh, they're definitely trying. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, they'd be stupid not to. Yeah. But I always say that a social media network dies when it's more people selling than actually like enjoying it and leisurely using it. Mm. Yeah, that's probably true. The first batch of episodes I made of this, I said that Instagram is coming up to the point, but I think that we're over the mark now. I think we've tipped Mm -hmm. into, into that where it's only going to go down. Right. What do you think about tattooers placing ads on Instagram? Like for instance, um, a friend of mine was telling me he travels and does a lot of conventions and, uh, and I was complaining, man, I'm having a hard time booking at these shows that I'm not known at, you know, I used to be able to post and there would be, you know, something would come back and I could book. And now I'm going to, you know, like, um, Puerto Rico coming up soon. And, and you know, the, there's no appointment. So he was like, man, you know, you gotta pay. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I, he pays in the region of the area he's going to. So within like a 25 minute or a 25 mile radius or whatever he chooses. And he's, he's, he's sending the ad to just those people. But yeah, I, I'd feel like, I think a lot of us feel like we would, it would be like kind of shameful yeah, to like have everyone see our sponsored posts. Like it's a little desperate, but I just don't know I if don't we're at that point though. now where we actually kind of have to do it. Well, that's, that's again, something that we didn't choose, but that's now what Instagram is. Like right. we said before, now we don't see, you don't see all the people that you follow. So now we have to pay for what we used to get for free. Right. But I, and I wouldn't be surprised if that was a long-term plan for them. Mm-hmm. Cause why wouldn't it be? Yeah. Cause their business and a lot of people forget this, that they're who they're selling to are their advertisers only. So to, to outline it like that and say, Oh, well we can increase revenues this way. Um, now we can sell to advertisers, but we can also sell to the people using it. So it's a way to create a premium service without saying that and scaring away a bunch of people or having outrage. Cause obviously if they're like, you know, $19 a month, Instagram, you'll get more reach, mm-hmm. which they could do. And I would probably pay for it. I would pay. And I don't think anyone would be shame, shamed for doing that. Mm-hmm. Cause why, why if you're going to fucking do it, you know, right. it's worth it. Yeah. So I don't know, but I, I have noticed that I used to, I used to laugh at people that really complained about having to scroll past ads on Instagram, but there's like a lot of ads now mm-hmm. and it's, and you can look and it's every four or every five posts. Right. It's an ad. Yeah. I'll see one tattooer and then a tattoo shop and then it runs out of like the ones targeted towards my interests. And then it's like Disneyland or, you know, whatever, just the general ones are. And then you just scroll, scroll, scroll until there's no ads left. So you can really see what they're offering or what is being targeted at you. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's better than watching television commercials of things I'm not interested in. Right. Like it's, it's a little more enjoyable to have, you know, ads served that are actually things I'm interested to find out about. So I think, you know, I'm not really all that mad about it. Um, I find things that I actually want through it. Right. Yeah, that's true. Watching TV. How many times have you actually seen something and you're like, yeah. hell yeah, I'm going to buy that. Cause it's mm. so general. Cause it yeah. has to be. Right. It's car commercials. How many people are going to buy that car? Right. A number of them, but yeah, it's so expensive for companies to market that way too. You know, just, yeah, this has leveled the playing field and allowed for, you know, sort of a little company to be able to exist, to be able to like have success, you know, just like Kickstarter allowed the little guy to make a, make a product, you know, without having to get a loan for, you know, from the bank or, you know, it's whatever, like, you know, the world is a lot more of a fair place for, for selling something 
yeah. for creating something. You know, you can you can make an Etsy store out of just about any craft, probably, and there's an audience for it. You know. I want to thank Russ for being on the show this week. You can find more about him on Instagram at Russ Abbott. That's two S's, two B's, and two T's. Go get tattooed in Roswell, Georgia at Ink and Dagger Tattoo. And if you want to learn more about Tattoo Smart, you can go to their website at tattoosmart.com. You're probably sick of hearing from me, but if you're not, you can find me on Instagram at Andrew Stortz, S-T-O-R-T-Z. If you enjoy listening, I urge you to please subscribe and also leave a five-star rating and a review. It really helps the show reach new listeners every week, the more reviews that we get. If you want to learn more about Books Closed, you can go to our website at booksclosedpodcast.com, where you'll find all the information you need, videos, episodes, guests, merch. It's all right there for you. Next week, we'll be back with an all-new episode, and I would be willing to bet that there will be some discussion about tattoos on it. We'll see you then.